Good evening and welcome to yet another episode of Who's Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters. We are still sailing, sailing along with Moses. You could say that he's on a roll <laughs> and so am I. In our last session, what we looked at was Moses being confronted by God to take the people out from the land of Egypt into the promised land. And Moses has that question, who am I? He saw his own inadequacy. He saw that he was not up to it. He brought out his objection and God said, do not be afraid, I will be with you. Now Moses takes it on to another level. Because his next question is, who are you? When I go to tell the people that you need to come out of the land of slavery, they'll ask me, why do you say that? In whose name do you come? By what authority and whose authority are you going to lead us out? We're going to look today at that question that Moses asked of God, who are you? And as we enter into that question on a deeper level, let us pray. A gracious and a loving Father, we thank you that you reveal your name and you reveal your presence to Moses. But we know also that you continue to reveal yourself, your face, your presence, even today. And as we reflect and pray on this biblical character, we pray that our hearts and our minds will be open to your revelation of your presence and of your name. We know that your spirit is accompanying us on this journey. And we make this prayer in deep faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. We see this question asked of God. Who are you? Or as the phrase says, what if they want to know who exactly sent me? What am I to say to them? It is interesting to know how God responds to Moses. And that response is found in chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. This is one of the most important and most complex verses that you will find not just in the Old Testament, but the entire Bible. Because several doctoral theses have been written on it. Books running into volumes have been written on it. Well, it's quite a challenge in this brief time that we have to speak about something so profound. It is a challenge and yet I humbly will embark on it simply because it is so important for us to understand this name, this God who reveals himself. I hope that with God's grace, I will be able to express this dense scholarship in a matter that is simple, but yet not simplistic. And so we invite the Spirit to guide us all in this reflection today. And I would invite you to read further so that you will come to understand better and deeper this wonderful text chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, that we are going to reflect on today. Now, it's interesting that in verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. Sometimes that's translated as, I will cause to be what I will cause to be. Or again, in this very verse, I am has sent me. But in verse 15, we have another dimension of this name. 
the Lord, the Lord, that's the phrase, the God of the ancestors. The word that is translated as Yahweh, which comprises of four Hebrew letters, Yod, He, Wow, and He, written as Y-H-W-H. And so God responds in this twofold manner. So how are we to understand this name? It seems to be quite cryptic, the way God reveals his name. It seems to say everything and yet says nothing. Because this name seems rather indefinable. There's not quite an agreement as to how the Hebrew is to be translated. But let, us that, let that not trouble us or upset us. Because what we are doing when we read a text like this is we are trying to capture the vast mystery of God. Just imagine, we are trying to understand the infinite in very finite terms. We are trying to speak about something that is unlimited with all the limitations of our human thought and language. So at best, what we have is a glimpse of what is the vast reality of who God is. And God gives us the intelligence and the grace to understand him deeper and on a more profound level. And we need to explore that. That's what we call the mystery of God's name. Now, let me get a little bit technical as I look at it from the grammar point of view. Now, both these verses, I am who I am and the Lord, are drawn from the Hebrew word to be, haya. It's interesting that in the Hebrew language, you have the regular verb to be, the normal verb. But Hebrew also has another kind of a verb, which is known as the causative verb. And those scholars who choose to translate or to interpret this word in the causative sense will translate as, I will cause to be. It's interesting that there are two ways of looking at it. Now, when we look at the first verse 14, what we are looking is at God describing God's self in verse 14. And that's the first dimension of God's name. God said to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. That's one step of revealing his name. And then we move on to verse 15. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. So what is happening in these verses? How do we understand these words that God addresses to Moses? You could say that God is qualifying his name. He is linking this name to the ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in doing so, we have three aspects that we can understand and appreciate. The first is God in God's own self, of who God is. The second is God reveals God's self in creation and through creatures. And the third is God is going to act through the covenant in salvation history. Now, let's try and understand this name. Because in the earlier section of the scriptures, the name used for God was El Elyon, which means the Most High, or El Shaddai, 
the almighty God or the God of the mountains. But now we are told of this name Yahweh. The question you may ask is, is this a new name? Did it not occur before? So it could be that the ancestors already knew the name Yahweh, but from now on, there is going to be a deeper and a more profound understanding of the name of God as Yahweh. God continues to reveal himself in dynamic ways, not only here, but also in chapter 34, when Moses is at Sinai. And I'd like to indicate once again how the name of the Lord comes into play. I read to you from chapter 34, verses 5 and 6. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name, the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And each time that I was pronouncing the word the Lord, in Hebrew it appears as Yahweh. So you can see that from now on, there is an unfolding of the different dimensions of what this sacred name is all about, revealed in different circumstances. Now, this was the name of God. It was a sacred name. And the early Jews found it was so sacred that they did, could not bring themselves to pronounce that name publicly or when reading aloud. So deep was their sense of respect for this name of God. And so with the passage of time, some of them chose instead of saying Yahweh to use the word Adonai. Some even more pious Jews preferred Another word, not just Adonai, but the name Hashem. So in the period of time, this name Yahweh was the unpronounceable name of God. You could write it, but it couldn't be pronounced. Now, it is interesting that hopefully through these episodes that we have, you are learning something. In this episode, I hope we can unlearn something because there is a certain confusion that comes with the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Let me put it this way. There are some people who use the term Jehovah. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides, or Jehovah's Witnesses. Now that is an erroneous pronunciation. Let me indicate the different steps that led to this. Well, the Hebrew text of the scriptures that were received in the original were only consonants. There were no vowels. The sense of the language indicated that you could imagine the vowels put to that. It's something like the texting that people do today. They write an alphabet without any of those vowels. Well, this went on until the Middle Ages, they had the text, but without the vowels. In the Middle Ages, a group of Jewish scholars known as the Masoretes began to put those vowel points to the Hebrew text. Now, what was interesting was to the consonants Yahweh, Y-H-W-H, they put the vowels of Adonai. Stay with me, it gets more interesting. So when they wrote the word YHWH, they put the vowels of Adonai. But they knew that it was to be pronounced as Yahweh, simply out of respect. Interestingly, in the 17th century, when the translators of who came about with the King James Version, they took the consonants Yahweh, but pronounced it with the vowels of Adonai, from which they got the word Jehovah. 
Now, there are some denominations and sects who use this word Jehovah besides the Jehovah Witnesses themselves. But certainly, Catholic and mainline Protestants do not tend to use this word Jehovah, Jehovah at all. It is important now at this stage that I take you into what the Greek translation of the Old Testament, what we've seen in an earlier time, the Septuagint. How did it handle the translation of Exodus chapter 3, verses 14 and 15? Let us now come to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is the Septuagint, which was done just around completed just around the time of Christ. When they were translating chapter 3, verse 14, they translated it as ego emi ho on, which is I am the one who is, or simply I am. It was interesting that when they chose to translate chapter 3, verse 15, the word Yahweh, what we translate as Lord, they used the word kurios from which we get Kyrie Eliason, Lord have mercy. And so in our Catholic tradition, there is, when it comes to using God's sacred name, there is a hesitancy to use Yahweh. It never uses Jehovah. It prefers the word Lord. Because this is the name, as we have seen, which is unique to the God of Israel. It's a personal name which he could be addressed. And so we find that this is the privileged name, Yahweh, the Lord, that is being revealed in chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Now, we come back to Moses' question. Who are you? Why does Moses ask that question? Well, for a number of reasons. Moses needed a proof that he has been sent. He's not coming just on behalf of a talking bush. He needed proof. Secondly, he wanted to claim some authority that he's not coming in his own name, but he's coming in the name of the God who sent him. Thirdly, He's hoping that with this credibility, he can persuade the people to believe that God has called him and has sent him. And then it is through these verses, he's receiving an assurance from God, I will be with you. And so Moses, in asking for that name, is receiving an assurance on many and different counts. Having looked at that, I now want to explore with you what does the revelation of the name say about God? As I said to you, it comes from the Hebrew word to be, I am. And this I am, God, is forever. God is, there is no beginning, there is no end. God was, is now, and ever shall be. So whether we see this God as I am, he becomes the source of our being. Or if we translate it as causative, I will cause to be, he's the cause of our being. So in God revealing his name, he's saying much more than what we normally would read. Because in the Bible, our name is more than just a name. A name is not just a sound by which you call someone. A name is not just a label by which you identify someone. It is something of your identity. Just think of each of the sons of Jacob, the 12 sons. Each of them are given a name which has a meaning, which reveals their identity. And this sense of identity is tied to their name. It reveals a character or sometimes the la lack of character. And therefore, to know a name is to know the essence and the character of a person. And that is why significantly, when there is a change in the identity of a person, there is a change in the name. 
Abram becomes Abraham, Sarai becomes Sarah, and Jacob becomes Israel. A change of name accompanies a change in identity. Now, yet another aspect that we should understand when it comes to the name is in the Bible, to know the name is to have power over someone. And that is why you should understand that in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, there is a prohibition of using God's name, using God's name in vain. On the other hand, the positive side is to call on God's name, is to know that God will hear your voice. God will hear your cry. But what I'd like to do with you is to show the implications of what does it mean for God to reveal his name to us. When God reveals his name to us, it is a way of saying that he joins the community. He becomes part of the human community. Secondly, God enters into the history of a people. God integrates himself with such a people and their journey through history. Thirdly, by giving the name, revealing his name, God is offering an invitation to intimacy, to closeness. But by the same count, God makes himself vulnerable. Because once you have that name, that name can be used, misused, and even abused. But once God has revealed his name, let us not hesitate to call upon the name of our God. With that intimacy, with that tenderness, which was his desire. Which brings me to my next point, which is one of my favorites. That God, especially in the scriptures, is a verb, not a noun. What do I mean? Just look at the way God has described in 3 verses 14 and 15. I am who I am. I am has sent you. I, the Lord, which comes again from the verb to be. In other words, God is revealing his very self in an active and a dynamic sense, not as a static being, a presence that is powerful and active. And that is going to be revealed in the Exodus experience and the Exodus story. Because all through, you're going to see the action of God. Let us just look at how the Greeks and the Greek philosophy looked at God. For them, God was more a noun. And they looked at very often as an abstract noun. So they spoke about the transcendence of God, God above everything or the omnipotence of God, the God who is all-powerful, the immanence of God, God who is to be found all over, or omniscient God, the God who is all-knowing. But for the Hebrews, God had to be someone concrete, practical, pragmatic. That presence had to be active and dynamic. So whether it is I am who I am or I will cause to be, we have a God expressed in very strong verbs. God sees and God hears. God feels and God remembers. God saves and God protects. God heals and God forgives. God liberates and God redeems. That's how God is known. I am who I am, the great I am. But the important thing is, this God who is the great I am, is not revealed only with this name in the Old Testament, but also in the New Testament. That name appears on the pages of the New Testament. When we look at the second person of the Holy Trinity, who comes to earth, takes flesh, becomes human, this Jesus now reveals himself as the great I am. If you look at the text, Matthew chapter 14, verses 
verse 22. Jesus is walking on the water. And it has a lot of significance because to walk on, on water is to say that you are ruling over the chaos. It brings before you the early pages of the book of Genesis. And when the disciples are afraid and they, and they look at him and Jesus says, Ego Amy, I am he. It is I. We have echoes of chapter 3, verse 14. When you look at the gospel according to John, very systematically, you will find seven times I am with some predicate which applies to the seven figures in the tabernacle from the book of Exodus. I'd like to quickly take you through these seven. For example, John chapter 6, verse 35 and 48, I am the bread of life. Or John 8, 12 and verse 9, chapter 9, verse 5, I am the light of the world. Third, John chapter 10, verse 7, I am the gate for the sheep. Fourth, John chapter 10, verses 11 to 14, I am the good shepherd. Again, John chapter 11, verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. And John 15, verses 1 and 5, I am the true vine. Now, these are not just throwaway lines. They're echoing what we've just looked at in the Old Testament. Let me draw your attention because there are other instances also in the Gospel of John, particularly in John chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. Over there, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. The soldiers are come in search of him to capture him at the time of the Passion. And he asked them, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And they fall to the ground. We can see in that gestures of respect and adoration. But the real one that takes everything away on a whole new level is in John chapter 8, verses 58, where Jesus speaks and talks to his fellow men and women. And he says, Abraham longed for this day. And then they, they get into an argument with him. And then Jesus makes that powerful statement in John chapter 8, verse 58. Before Abraham was, I am. Nothing else. It's just that's it. That is the face of God being revealed to us in Jesus. St. Paul, in his letter to the Philippians, has a very interesting text. It's an ancient hymn, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. And it will be really worthwhile to read this because, as I indicated, the second person of the Trinity, who now takes flesh. And he says, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now listen carefully. Verses 9 and the following. Therefore, it's a very crucial verb, a, a phrase that is used, a turning point. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
the Old Testament shadow falls on the new and it is fulfilled in the new. We've looked at this marvelous, marvelous revelation of the name of God revealed to Moses in Moses' day, revealed to Paul in Paul's day and revealed to you and to me today. Jesus is the great I am and with his name comes a promise. I will be with you all days to the end of time. What a wonderful name to rejoice in because it's not just a promise. It's an assurance that his name will be with us always and through his name his presence. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Who's Who in the Bible, Praying with Biblical Characters. This is a reflection that needs to continue. Ponder on the name of God. See how close you are to this God and bear this name of God so other people will know through your life and mine that Christ lives in us. Good night and God bless you all.